Hi, everyone. This is the first lecture of new material that will appear on the midterm uh, that you will not have a quiz on. So this is the new material for the midterm exam. This is the first of three lectures on the endocrine system. And this serves as sort of an introduction to hormones and sort of the basic uh, mechanisms that we're going to be discussing when we explore the specific uh, endocrine glands. So first of all, we'll compare the endocrine and nervous systems and show how uh, uh, the endocrine gland can communicate to its target organ. Uh, we'll classify the chemistry of hormones and discuss a little bit more about uh, second messenger systems. Okay. So start with the basics. The endocrine system. Okay. In 203, uh, 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 if you were in my class, I told you when you think of the endocrine system, you think of two things. You think of hormones and you think of the circulation because that's the means by which hormones are circulated throughout the body is in the bloodstream. So let's compare the differences and similarities between the nervous and the endocrine systems. Okay, we're fairly we're fairly confident now uh, of our knowledge of the nervous system, but how does this compare to the endocrine system? Because if we don't really cover the endocrine system too much in SCB 203. So in this table, we have a comparison between the two uh, uh, types of communication. On the left column, we have the nervous system, and in the right column, we have the endocrine system. So let's see how that they are similar and different. Both use chemicals, okay. So uh, neurotransmitters versus uh, hormones. However, there's a major difference in how they affect their target system. In the nervous system, uh, these chemicals directly affect target cells. Wherever a, a tissue is innervated, that target tissue will be uh, affected by the nervous system. On the other hand, the endocrine system indirectly affects target cells. It's more global because wherever the bloodstream can reach, in theory, those hormones can have an effect. So the major difference between the two is how they affect it. In the nervous system, it's directly affecting. In the endocrine system, it's indirectly affecting. What about these chemicals between the two types of uh, communication systems? In the nervous system, we said they use neurotransmitters like acetylcholine. In the endocrine system, they use hormones. Now, how about the speed of action of communication? Well, the, the nervous system is more like email. It's faster, okay? Because uh, a lot of them uh, uh, transmit through action potentials and then secrete their, their neurotransmitters. However, the endocrine system, it's a little bit slower because they get secreted into the bloodstream and eventually they may reach their target uh, organs. So the endocrine system is slower. It's sort of like a, a snail mail, original old, mat, old fashioned, put a stamp on a letter and eventually we'll get there. So the major difference between the two is that the nervous system is faster generally and the endocrine system is slower. What about the extent of their effects? Well, even though that the nervous system is faster, their, their effects are, sh are, are short lasting, they're quicker. So they have to be uh, repeated if you want a continued response. In the endocrine system, they have much long lasting effects. As long as the hormone can stay in circulation, they will interact with their receptors at their target organ. So endocrine system is, have long, generally has longer lasting effects, whereas the nervous system is, is shorter and quicker effects. Okay, let's look at hormone secretion. Remember, hormone secretion is through the distribution by the blood. Okay, so this is not the most, um, you know, important figure. All it is showing is that uh, this, uh, the circulatory system is the means by which hormones are transported throughout the, 
the body. So wherever you have uh, vascular tissue, hormones in theory should be able to get to the tissues. But as we will see, the target cells must have the required uh, receptor for that particular hormone. Okay, so obviously through the bloodstream, you learn in SCB-203 SCB that the bloodstream will go through the arterial system, to the capillaries, to the tissues, and then from the tissues back through the veins. And this is how hormones are transported uh, throughout the body. Okay. Okay. So in this figure, they're showing the capillary bed of an endocrine organ where it secretes its hormone in the bloodstream. It goes to the heart where it's pumped to the rest of the body to get to the tissues. And if the tissues have the correct receptor, then it can interact with the hormone. Okay. If, if the tissues do not have the right receptor, then it ignores it. Okay. There are different types of chemical signals that we can describe. And uh, some of these you may have heard before. We have the endocrine signals, we have paracrine signals, and we have autocrine signals. Okay. If you know these prefixes, you might have an idea what they mean. Endocrine signals are those uh, hormones that are secreted in the bloodstream that affect distant tissues. Okay. So this is not too, uh, an endocrine means within the body. Okay, so this is much more our classical idea of how a hormone acts through the bloodstream uh, after being secreted by uh, an organ or a, a tissue and it affects distant tissues. So in this picture here, we see the, the pathway here and the first one is the endocrine system. We see the endocrine cell secreting its hormones and it goes to the blood and it will affect distant, distant cells that have receptors. And the, that the key thing here is there are different cell types and they're distant. Okay. And also they're going through the bloodstream. Paracrine signals. Hmm. Well, we've heard of a paramedic. A paramedic is a near nearby physician. So a paracrine, paracrine signal are secreted by cells and uh, cells that are nearby, but are different types of cells. And they're secreted into extracellular fluid. Some hormones act as paracrine signals. So they're secreted in the extracellular fluid and they act in nearby cells. Okay, so here's a tissue cell secreting its paracrine chemical into the extracellular fluid and it affects uh, nearby cells that are different. And we said that some hormones uh, act by this mechanism. We also have autocrine signals. Auto means self. So instead of uh, affecting nearby different cells, these are affecting cells that are the same cell or cell type. So these cells are secreting chemicals that are affecting uh, the same cell type or uh, the, the same cell. And hormones can also act as autocrine signals. So in this picture, we have uh, a specialized cell secreting an autocrine chemical that may act, may act on the same cell itself or a nearby cell of the same cell type. So in other words, what this table is showing that hormones can act through the typical classical endocrine pathway, hormones can act through paracrine pathways, hormones can also act through autocrine pathways. So make sure you, you know the differences between the three. Let's look at some of the, an overview of the endocrine organs. And this is not a complete list, but covers the majority of the endocrine glands uh, that we know of. We have what are called the primary endocrine organs. Okay, we'll just list them for now. And uh, we'll talk about each one in this lecture or subsequent lectures. We have the anterior pituitary gland, thyroid gland, parathyroid gland, the adrenal cortex, pancreas, and thymus. Okay, and here's roughly the idea uh, uh, lo relative locations of some of these. The anterior pituitary is in the brain, thyroid glands in your throat, thymus gland is uh, on, on the surface uh, uh, on anterior to your heart, 
and the pancreas is part of your digestive system. We also have what are called secondary endocrine organs. Okay. Uh, uh, these are like the reproductive organs, like the testes and ovaries. Okay. So you have a choice. You can have testes or you can have ovaries. Okay. If you're female, generally you have ovaries, and if you're male, you have generally have testes. We also have what are called secondary neuroendocrine organs that secrete what are called neurohormones. And uh, examples of these are the hypothalamus, the pineal gland, the adrenal medulla, and the posterior pituitary gland. Okay, so here's the hypothalamus, very close uh, relationship to the pituitary gland, also the pineal gland, and the posterior pituitary gland. And the adrenal medulla is in, in, in the deeper layer of the adrenal gland that's sitting on top of the kidneys. Other secondary organs that are neither neural or endocrine are, are the kidneys, the heart, and adipose tissue. Okay. Now this list is not complete, as almost every tissue now will also have uh, paracrine and autocrine functions. So here are some hormone basics. Hormones are chemical messengers that regulate other cells. Okay or if you're an autocrine pathway, it's affecting it itself. Hormones can have a wide variety of effects all over the body. So wherever the bloodstream goes, it can have effects on those tissues. Now we said that hormones are slower than the nervous system, but within the endocrine system itself, we may have a big uh, disparity on the effects, depending on the distance and the receptors that are involved. So some act quickly over seconds to minutes, while others may take hours or longer. So there's a wide variety of the effects, the time effects of hormones. Okay. Now, we know that, that most hormones pass through, are, are transported through the bloodstream. But even then, there are different ways they are transported within the bloodstream. So we have what are called hydrophilic hormones that can dissolve in the plasma. And they have no problem being transported and they freely travel in the blood, diffusing in the blood, and they go their merry way through the force of the heart contraction. Hydrophobic hormones, however, in order to shield them from the aqueous environment, they are bound to what are called plasma protein carriers because they don't like the water in the plasma, and so they get protected and shielded from it. And regardless of hydrophilic or hydrophobic, they circulate until they're taken up by a target cell, or broken down, or even deactivated. So just because they're secreted doesn't mean a hormone will actually find a receptor. Okay, so how do we remove hormones? Well, some hormones are quickly inactivated in the cells they affect. So once they bind the receptor, then they are no longer functional. A lot of them are removed by the kidneys or broken down by the liver, and they're metabolized. And of course, hydrophilic hormones are easier to be removed uh, since they're water soluble than hydrophobic hormones. So they will clear faster than the lipid soluble hormones. Okay, let's talk about the target cells and receptors. Okay, so for a hormone to have an effect, it must have the receptor. If, the, if, the, if a cell does not have the receptor, it just simply ignores whatever hormones that are present. So hormones affect target cells by binding to its receptors. Not every cell will have the same receptor. Now, uh, if a cell has a receptor, they may be different, uh, different uh, uh, they may be localized differently within the cell. We have integral receptors within the plasma membrane. We may have cytosolic receptors in the cytoplasm. And some receptors may be nuclear. So in other words, the signal must have to must have of the hormone must have to get into the nucleus of the cell. So let's look at uh, this is looking at the target cells and receptors. 
Okay, hydrophilic hormones uh, cannot cross uh, uh, cannot cross the phospholipid bilayer, so they must must have some sort of uh, they must have some sort of receptor or a way to get inside the cell. Hydrophobic hormones they can pass through the phospholipid bilayer, so they don't do not necessarily need a cell surface receptor. So here is a hydrophilic molecule illustrating this fact. It cannot cross the lipid bilayer. A hydrophobic molecule can diffuse the lipid bilayer and can diffuse across into this cytoplasm. Okay. So let's look at the target cells and receptors, uh, whether a hormone is hydrophilic or if a hormone is hydrophobic. Okay. So hydrophilic hormones, remember, they can be transported in the plasma. Uh, but they must bind integral membrane receptors since they can't cross the lipid bilayer. And the binding sites are usually exposed on the cell surface. And a lot of times the receptors are often associated with another membrane protein. Hydrophobic hormones, since they can cross the plasma membrane, they, they can have various choices of receptors. They can bind in the receptors in the membrane, in the cytosol, or in the nucleus. Now, receptor number doesn't always stay the same. It may, and the number of receptors may vary depending on the needs of the body. So if there's an increase in a hormone that's been secreted, oftentimes the receptors may uh, respond by increasing their numbers in a process called upregulation. So increasing the number of receptors is called upregulation. Likewise, if there's prolonged exposure to a hormone, it may become desensitized, and the opposite effect will happen, and the receptors will decrease in number or downregulate. Okay, let's look at the different classes of hormones. Generally, we can divide them into amino acid based hormones, because they're derived from amino acids, or steroid hormones, because they're derived from cholesterol. Okay. So the amino, amino acid-based hormones uh, can vary from just single amino acids to several amino acids, in which we call them peptide hormones. Okay. And most of these are hydrophilic. There's one exception of a peptide hormone which is not hydrophilic, and that is thyroid hormone. So you might want to you know, keep this in the back of your mind that this is the only uh, uh, protein hormone that is not hydrophilic. On the other hand, steroid hormones are derived from cholesterol, and they have many of these have these large hydrocarbon rings, and these are all hydrophobic. Okay, let's look at the different mechanisms of hormone action, and it'll differ depending if the hormone is hydrophilic or hydrophobic. So let's begin with the hydrophilic hormones. Many involve second messenger systems using G proteins because it cannot cross the membrane. So what it does, it uses second messengers to re relay the message into the cell. And it is the second messenger that's stimulated by the G protein that initiates the cellular change. Okay. After the hormone binds, it probably just degrades. And we mentioned in previous lectures the advantage of second messenger systems is we can have a single amplification. So one hormone can bind a receptor which may activate a G protein which may have activate many second messengers. So in this diagram we see a hydrophilic hormone binding to its receptor and see this is an integral membrane receptor. Remember integral proteins are those that that span the entire uh, lipid bilayer. And we can see that a, a, a G protein may be inactive at the time, but upon binding to its receptor, the G protein becomes activated and leaves the receptor and then binds to uh, a, another molecule, many of which are enzymes. So in this case, here this enzyme is called endolite cyclase, which we spoke about in previous lectures. Adenocyclate will convert ATP 
into cyclic ANP. And cyclic ANP is now the second messenger. And we can see the amplification effects of cyclic ANP because it can have a number of effects within the cell. Okay, so one, one, uh, one effector is another enzyme called protein kinase A. And what protein kinase A does, it adds a phosphate to uh, proteins which can uh, activate them or inactivate them. And we have a multitude of different effects within the cell. And we can also have this amplification effect. So from this one hormone, we can have many different uh, responses within the cell. Now, let's look at uh, the difference now that we know how a hydrophilic hormone acts, how a hydrophobic hormone acts. Okay. Here we have a hydrophobic hormone. Remember, it can dissolve and diffuse right across the lipid bilayer. So it does not need a cell service receptor, although it could have a cell service receptor. And here in this particular example, we have an intracellular receptor that binds to the hormone. And once bound into once once it's bound, it carries it into the nucleus. Because they it needs this, this little transporter because the hydrophobic hormone doesn't like the aqueous environment of the uh, cytoplasm. And then this hormone receptor complex interacts with the DNA to, to uh, affect cellular change. So, for example, uh, it may turn on genes so that a messenger RNA is produced to create a new protein. That's an example. Okay, now that we know how hydrophilic hormones work, are act, and hydrophobic hormone, hormones act, let's look at some effects of hormones. Okay, so this is just a general table. Uh, we'll go into more specifics as we cover each individual uh, hormone. Okay. Some examples of hormone actions. It, it may affect secretion from endocrine or circadian glands. So a hormone can affect uh, a, another endocrine gland, for example. Uh, it can, as we saw in the previous examples, it can activate or inhibit enzymes. It may have effects on mitosis or meiosis. It may open or close ion channels, and of course, opening or closing ion channels may have effects on the membrane potential. And as we saw in the last example, with the hydrophobic hormone, it may activate or inhibit the transcription of genes. So this is just a, gen this is just a general kind of uh, table to provide different examples of hormone action. Okay. Let's look at the regulation of hormone secretion now. Uh, it can be initiated several ways. It can be uh, initiated hormonally with another hormone, humorally, or by through neural stimuli. So let's look at each of these three uh, mechanisms. Let's look at hormonal stimuli. So what this means is that some endocrine cells alter the secretion in response to other hormones. So in this case, one, one, a hormone affects the secretion of another hormone. Okay. And it, it could also, it could be stimulatory or it could be inhibitory. And this left panel is uh, stimulatory. For example, growth hormone releasing hormone, GHRH, stimulates the secretion of growth hormone from the anterior pituitary cell. So here, one hormone is activating another hormone, or activating the secretion of another hormone from another tissue. We can also have hormonal inhibition. For example, somatostatin is a hormone which will inhibit the secretion of growth hormone. So here's somatostatin in the bloodstream, and it binds to its receptor and inhibits uh, the secretion of growth hormone. And for many hormones, uh, there are both uh, stimulatory and inhibitory mechanisms. How about humoral stimuli? Humoral stimuli, many endocrine cells respond to changes of certain ions or molecules in the blood or extracellular fluid. So they're not responding to another hormone, re respond to another substance like ions or molecules in the blood. 
So one example of humoral stimuli is, is, is glucose. Okay. So for example, uh, glucose uh, uptake by a pancreatic cell, here's a pancreatic cell and then the green is glucose, it will stimulate the secretion of insulin. So in this case, it's not another hormone, but it's a molecule like glucose. It's stimulating insulin secretion. And finally, the third type of stimulation of uh, hormones secretion is neural stimuli. Some cells respond to signals from the nervous system. So in this case here, uh, if you remember, the adrenal gland is sort of like a giant ganglion. And within the adrenal medulla, we have sympathetic neurons that stimulate the secretion of epinephrine and norepinephrine into, uh, into the, into the uh, bloodstream. Okay, and this is in response uh, from the effects of the nervous system from the sympathetic nervous system. And we said in early, earlier lectures that this is why epinephrine and norepinephrine can act as both as a neurotransmitter in the nervous system, but here it can act as a hormone because now they're going to the bloodstream through the uh, adrenal medulla. Okay. Now, a very uh, common mechanism for hormone action is through negative feedback loops. And you learned about negative feedback loops probably on the first lecture of SCB203. Okay, and this is gonna be playing an important role in, reg in the regulation of many hormones. Okay, so as a review, uh, remember negative feedback, the, the effects are opposite to the stimulus. So for example, if, if a stimulus decreases a physiolo physiological variable, what happens? Well, uh, uh, this will be detected by a receptor on an endocrine cell and sees the decrease in, in, in this particular physiological variable. You know, it could be, I don't know, blood sugar, for example. And in response, uh, the, the control center, which is often the endocrine cell itself, increases or decreases the secretion of a particular hormone. Okay, and then this hormone goes through the bloodstream and it triggers a response in the target cells that moves the conditions towards the normal range. And it raises that physical response. So if the blood sugar was too low, it will raise blood sugar. And this is uh, your typical negative feedback pathway where the stimulus is opposite to the effect. And it's probably the most common type of homeostatic mechanism. Okay, well, we'll return to negative feedback loops as we talk about the specific hormones. Okay, hormone interactions. Okay, many have complementary or reversing actions. So in other words, we have several hormones that may act similarly. Okay, and they may be complementary. Again, we may have a set of hormones that work in opposite effects. And so they may reverse each other's actions. So those hormones that work together that, that function for a similar response, these are called synergists. And generally, the response of the two hormones together is greater than each hormone by themselves. And that's, that's really the definition of synergism. Okay. Uh, those hormones that have opposite effects are antagonists. So one may, for example, raise blood sugar, another hormone may decrease blood sugar. And so those are antagonists. 